Welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains. Here, this is the spot. Where the conversation is pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. Welcome home, Brains. There's only one requirement to hang out on the edge, is that you open your big brain and close your small mind. Did you bring your thinking caps? It's time to put them on, because the conversation starts now. temperatures hit over a hundred up there i can't believe that oh it was you know it hits 100 over 100 every once in a while i think the last time was 2000 like nine that it, it hit the record of 103 and in seattle it topped out at 108 but i'm east of seattle and one of our communities was 116 <laughs> it's just incredible and the scary thing is that over 50% of the people here don't have air conditioning. Mm. I grew up in Southern California and we never had air conditioning, you know, it's yeah, you just, know, close to the beach, but it's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, brains welcome. And I want you to know that you are here on the edge, the place where the conversation is pointed, the guests are sharp and the responses are never dull. Today, our guest is Maureen Curis. She's got the perfect name for our conversation today, because that's what she does. She helps cure us of many things, of you know people that have had traumatic illnesses from brain to end of life, but also curing us of another disease, of racial destruction, a racial dis-ease. And she does a lot of work in civil rights, and so I'm so excited to talk to her on many levels. We've been trying to do this for a while, and she just had company and, you know, uh, all this heat wave. So now we're just going to kind of level out and talk about some things that people don't talk about. We're going to talk about end-of-life care. You know, talking about end-of-life care brains is as important as talking about living. Making preparations, understanding the transition. What are you telling your children about life and death? How are you living your life? when it comes to racial equality. So we're going to get into it on many, many levels. Help me welcome her to the edge, Maureen Curis. Hi, sweetheart. Hi there, April. I'm so glad to have you here. Well, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, it's great. I've had a few of your friends on the show as well. Ah, wonderful. Yeah, we've done some great things. So share with my brains a little bit about your background and your history and where all this started for you. Well, my current endeavor is called Radiant Morning, and I help people with getting their end of life wishes decided, documented, and discussed. But that really started back when I first started out of nursing school. I got my first job in an oncology, on an oncology unit, working with people with cancer. And I thought, how scary is that? I don't want to do that. But it was the only place I could get my job. And I thought, I'm going to get a year's experience and then get out of here as fast as I can, because I didn't want to do anything like that. But over the course of that year, I fell in love. I fell in love with the patients. I fell in love with their families. And I realized that that end of life journey is not scary. And it can be quite peaceful and beautiful. And so most of my nursing career has been in end of life fields oncology, hospice, um, ICU, the intensive care unit. And I've seen what can happen when people don't have candid conversations about what they want at end of life and how that makes such a difference. It makes such a difference because I'm going to share um, some things that I you know, don't normally share with my brains is the end of life experience that I had with my mother. I think I shared it with you. You did. Me and my mother were peanut butter and jelly. You know, and there was not a conversation that we had not had. Uh, There was nothing that was left unsaid. There were no questions that were left unanswered. And I got to help my mother transition with dignity. I was fortunate enough that she died here in our home with hospice care. So shout out to Kaiser. Uh, Their hospice care, I tell you, was amazing. I couldn't even think of what I wanted to do or what I needed and the phone didn't ring. How you doing? What do you need? You know, you need anything from the store? Do I need anything from the store? You know, they were absolutely amazing. 
uh, it was very hard to see my mother go through that, but she was 91 years old and she was tired. And she was tired of being poked and probed and blood taken and can't eat and can't use the bathroom or using the bathroom too much. And then also when you're in these care facilities and I, you know, I admire them, but they're tired too. They, you know, you got the kidney in 504, you got the brain tumor in 407, you got the person that we just cleaned up 20 minutes ago that's going to have to wait to the second shift. My mother didn't have to experience that. And I got to lay my chest on top of her chest and feel her very last heartbeats, just like she felt my very first heartbeats when I came into the world. And it was amazing. And I'm going to share one more story with you, Brains. Someone told me, said, you know what, April? Life is a challenge when you arrive because you come in through a place between urination and defecation. And you're delivered in a puddle of blood and slime. Some people are forced out. Some people are cut out. Some people come out naturally. But when you arrive, there's people there to greet you. They've given you a party. You've had a shower. You've got gifts. There's bright lights and they're clapping and they're laughing and they're so excited and they can't stop kissing you. So death is the same way. You got to go through another portal. Some people are forced out. Some people were cut out. Some people go naturally. But when they go through that portal, know that there's another bright light. There's another party. There's folks to greet you. They may even give you a shower. And when Dr. Cornell West told me that, I tell you, I was bent but not broken. It was just such a visual. And that's what Maureen is doing. She's helping people trans. Uh, transport through this portal because death is a reality let me tell you it's a given just like your taxes you gonna die eventually so what you want to think about is how you're living if all of your end of life wishes uh, are documented if you have someone that you can trust because I'm telling you when folks die it, other folks come up out the ground they want to steal your property, that, you know, they want to make the decision. They're not happy with the will and trust. Maureen, tell me some of the experiences you've had and some of the work that you're doing. Oh, gosh, there's so many. You know, first of all, I want to say something you said, um, just like taxes, death's going to happen. But, you know, we don't actually have to pay our taxes. <laughs> They'll come after us, but we will die. There's no getting out of this life alive. So I love that you're talking about this. Um, you know, I've watched so many times when families either at the bedside have been afraid to talk about this. So they don't. So then when something happens that they're, they just have no idea what to do. And then they start fighting and it's a horrible experience. The real, the real impetus for me years ago to encourage everyone to get their end of life wishes documented or at least have a person that can make decisions on their behalf that was written down legally so they could legally make those decisions. There was a, a woman that was 62 that had been playing tennis in the morning she took her 85 year old mother to a doctor's appointment then out to lunch and on the way home slumped over the wheel of her car and had a massive heart attack Ooh, and uh, her 85 year old mom pulled her from the car and started cpr as she had seen it on tv and you know this was back in the mid 90s not everyone had cell phones glued to their hands like i do now you know but uh, she ended up in the icu and i was the nurse that admitted her and she was heavily, heavily sedated on a ventilator. And over the course of the next three days, we tried to lighten up. The doctors tried to lighten up her sedation, but she wasn't waking up. So they had to do a brain scan and they found that she had no brain activity. She had been deprived of oxygen for too long. So she was brain dead. And that's when the fighting with her four kids, she didn't have a husband, but the four kids, they started, it was like a war zone just fighting and two of them wanted to take her off the ventilator and let her die naturally and two of them accused their siblings of trying to kill her and it was awful and I thought I never want anyone I know and love to go through this 
And that's where these conversations are so important, talking about it. You know how I've heard a number of times people suing their family members because of the estate, you know, the will distribution. I One man that um, I know, his siblings were all suing him. He was the executor of the estate because they accused him of stealing from the, the parents' estate. And even though he presented documents, had, you know, legal documents, accounting documents, they still didn't believe him. And he's like, we will never speak again when this is all settled, you know? And I thought, that's what I want to prevent. I want to prevent people from fighting at someone's bedside because they don't know what to do and they've never talked about it. And I want to prevent those fractures over the lamp of the corner. Everyone's fighting over the lamp at the corner and it destroys families. But if we forget, what they forget is that, you know, you're um, the person that's laying there, they can still hear what's going on. Yes, they can. You know? Yeah. Can I tell a funny story about that? Yes. Uh, I had a patient that I took care of years and years and years ago, and uh, he was so hard of hearing, but every time his wife and daughter walked into the room, he would put his hand on his forehead, shake his head back and forth and say, these gosh darn, not quite in those terms, these gosh darn women are driving me crazy. So um, I'd always say, don't say that, they're right here. So he came in one afternoon and he was actively dying. And I happened to be working that day and um, I had just loved this man. Uh, But his wife came in and he was unresponsive. Didn't, you know, wasn't responding to anything. And I said, well, get down and let him know that you're here. Tell him that you're here because I believe he can hear you. And uh, she got down there and she, you know, in her little soft old lady voice, Ralph, I'm here. (laughs) You know, he's hard of here and deaf as a doornail. So I got down and yelled in his ear, you know, Ralph, your wife is here with you. And he put his hand to his forehead and shook his head back and forth. And he, that's all he did. That was the only response. And I said, yes, he can hear you. He, he can hear and he knows you're here. But I just had to laugh because it was just his response. And he never made another response until he died. Um, so they can hear. It's the they last can sentence. Hear, and they can feel. And you know, and you feel too. And brains, you're fighting over the caucus of what a person used to be. You're fighting over things. Nobody's rich, but believe me, God is looking at you. And when you act ugly like that, everything you get, it's not going to turn to gold. It's going to turn to sand and coal. Yeah. Nothing. There's no, no good in that. I mean, these are people that you grew up with. It's your brother. It's your blood. The only people that you have in the world. And you're going to fight with them over a piece of property that you're not going to be able to take with you. Uh, And again, the person that's passing away, each one of us, take that into consideration. What if you got stepkids? You know, biological kids with your current wife. There's going to be a fight. Uh, People don't think that they're worthy. Or, uh, you know, the insurance policy. Do you have all your beneficiaries lined up? If you own something that you have worked for your entire life, How much more time and energy does it take to have it documented as to who you want it to go to? You know, make it easy for them. My mother made it easy for me. She gave me two things. She gave me a safety deposit box key and a business card. I was done, okay? But other people have to go through probate and they forget that the attorney gets 33% of that off the top. Yeah. And what about a, a medical, um, medical, what is it, a medical directive? Yeah, the uh, medical uh, power of attorney, healthcare power of attorney, and the advanced directive. The advanced directive, the medical power of attorney is part of it. That's where you can state what you want. That's where you can write out, you know, do you want to be on life support? Do you not? If you do, what are the parameters? Um, would you want CPR started? Would you want tube feedings? But it also spells out who you want to speak on your behalf if you're unable to do so. And that, if you do nothing else but get that document done. And you don't even need to go to an attorney to get these documents. You can get them off the internet um, or yeah, you can get them off. And I think in California, they either have to be witnessed by two people that are not related to you or 
notarized by a notary. And that's the same up here in Washington state, but it's as easy as that. And you can change it. So you should have the first one, just one that can make decisions. And then if they're unable to do it, you should have a secondary person listed and get that legal, legal document done if nothing else. <laughs> but you know what, people are scared to talk about death. Yes, they Even are. When they talk to children. Oh, Nana's just sleeping. That's the worst thing that I think you could do to a child. You have to explain to them what this transition is because they'll be afraid to go to sleep. You know, can I, my best friend died 11 years ago of cancer and she had an 11 year old and a 14 year old and she would not talk to them about it. She said, nope, they know I'm sick, but I'm going to get well. And I said, but Barbara, you've relapsed. And the mm. chances of you getting well are really slim. She would not talk to them about it. And after she died, they really struggled. Then there was another family at our school where the mom died of cancer also. But soon after both of these women, they died within five minutes of each other. A friend of mine who had a young son and her young son was friends with the other mother's young son. And they were driving by a local cemetery. And this little second grader said, you know, that's where my mom is. That's, um, she's buried in there, but that's not really where she is. She lives in our heart. Mm. And she, it's just where her body is and her soul's in heaven. But she wanted us to know where she would be in case we needed to be near her physical body. It's in the ground there. But her soul and her heart lives in our hearts and in heaven. And I thought, and watching those two kids, that young boy and his older sister navigate her death and life after 11, almost 11 years ago, I still see things. I know their dad and, but watching the difference between these two families, it was night and day. These two kids, my best friend's kids struggled for years. Um, they've come out on the other side but they've gone through a hard journey. And then here was this mother that talked to them age appropriately and shared her whole journey with them. But to the fact to show them where she would be buried, how hard would that be as a mother? But how, what a gift to those kids. What a gift. You yeah. shared another very special story with me that I hope that you share with my brains about how you really understand now that there is a life uh, a hereafter. Yes. Tell me about your experience there um, I was working in an ICU and there was a, a gentleman he was 82 and he had been admitted late in the day the day before and I was the nurse that admitted him I was working the next day so that meant I had him and it was first thing in the morning we were going through our morning report when his monitor just flat lined. it was called so we had to do a code blue on him where you know he had no pulse and so we're all in there big team working on him and um he, we got his heart rate back, heart beating, but he didn't wake up. And he had a 30 year old daughter who was his only child and his wife had died when this girl was two. So the two of them were very close and she just wouldn't leave his bedside. She was beside herself. And I had assured her that if she went home to have dinner with her two little girls and her husband, I would stay till whatever hour she got back. Cause I worked till seven 30 at night. And I said, I'll stay. Even if it's 10 o'clock, you stay, put them in bed. I will not leave him until you get back. So it, she asked me to put his dinner tray over the bed that, you know, on the table that goes over the bed in case he woke up and was hungry. And I thought, I don't think he's going to wake up, but I didn't tell her that, you know, I thought, Oh, he's not, he's not going to wake up. Well, it was about five minutes till seven, just getting ready to change shift. The light goes on and I go in and he's sitting up in bed. He didn't need a ventilator. He, he was breathing on his own, even when he was unconscious. So he wasn't on a ventilator, which so uh, most of the time patients that go through that, especially with his condition would end up on a ventilator. So um, he said, who am I? And I said, what do you mean? Who am I? And he said, tell me my name. So I told him his name and he said, that can't be, I died today. And I said, no, you actually didn't die today. And he's like, no, I did. And he told me exactly what I had done during this code, you know, trying to resuscitate him and exactly what the resident that had admitted him. We were the two he remembered. He said, oh, I was right up there in the corner watching. And he told me that he heard his wife calling him. And he was trying to get through the door and the door would only open so far, but not far enough to get him mm -hmm. through. 
And he's like, my wife was calling me. All I wanted to do was to go to my wife. And I was just like, I still get chills thinking about it because, you know, you hear these stories, but to experience it firsthand was so powerful for me because I believe in heaven. I am a Christian woman and that is my my hope is for you know a heavenly rebirth but to hear this man stated so clearly and we talked about how his daughter was holding him here and we had to work on her being able to be let go of him and it took her a few weeks but he died about three weeks later she was peaceful they had made you know everything was okay but he was able to go up to meet his wife and the if i could have would have should have yeah you know the grief Cause we're all going to go through grief. You know, my mother had a beautiful transition. It was a oh. rite of passage for me, my daughter, you know, Mr. Magnificent. He was, he was, my husband was wonderful. All he said to me is baby, how can I serve? What do you need? What do mama need? When he come home from work, he bypassed me and go check on my mother. You know, so she, I get choked up when I think, about oh, it. I but, but you know, it's so important. And again, okay. We're talking about the great stories. There are people that have, you know, hell on wheels with their brothers and their, you know, sexual assault and abuse and, and alcoholism and drugs, all of that. I get it. Yeah. But you've got to learn to make peace. You've got to learn to make peace. And if this is not for you, you've got to learn to be able to just walk away. Yes. Don't continue to fight, you know, or you try to vindicate somebody else's wrong, you know, oh, well, you did this to Aunt Betty. And so now, you know, the rest of the family's gonna suffer. I'm gonna not put your name on the obituary. I'm gonna not give you your money in the will. I'm gonna take you to court. All of that stuff is just so ugly. It is. And you know, the more we can talk about it beforehand, the easier it'll be. Like you said, we're gonna all grieve. Even when we talk about it and it's a peaceful death and one beautiful like you had with your mom, but wouldn't it be terrible if we didn't grieve? Cause I feel like if we didn't grieve, it meant like we didn't care and we didn't love. So I'll take any amount of grief knowing that I loved that person or I loved that pet. But um, I look and what you were I'm saying is that pet too, because my, the coyotes kidnapped my dog and oh. ate. I know jumped over the fence and five pounds. I was devastated. I know. I, a coyote got one of our cats and I was devastated too, but you know, that's grieving. We grieve for our pets. Of course. Yeah. They're yeah. And then, you had said there are families that really struggle because of, like you said, the uh, abuse, sexual abuse, dysfunction. And so not everyone is going to have this loving, loving, wonderful end of life experience that you had with your mom. And you can make peace with it. I worked with a woman that somehow she worked through her assault issues from her father. Her father had sexually abused her, but she found it in her heart to forgive him before he died. Hmm. And she said, as hard as that was, she had to really let go to be able to live peacefully after he died. And I just thought, I don't know how you would do that. But she, this woman managed to find it in her heart to do. And people that, you know, that forgiveness is another big thing, you know, forgive people and ask for forgiveness because life's too short to carry that around. Mm -hmm. And um, people that have wanted forgiveness or wanted to forgive someone, but the person's already died, you can do that after the fact too. Write a letter, have a little ritual and just ask them for forgiveness of any wrong you might've given or done them or forgive them and put it out there. And they will know. They'll know. So I think that's another way of healing if we can if we can get to that point. And not everyone can, and that's okay too. Well, you have done a lot of healing in other ways too. A lot of forgiveness, a lot of thinking, and I commend you as being a white woman, uh, loving and supporting my community, the black community, through the Black Lives Matter, and just opening up the conversation to another type of healing, to another type of open wound that people keep pouring salt in, that people uh -huh. won't forgive, that people are just really, you know, tearing out the heart. It's another type of cancer. It's a cancer of the soul. 
Yes, it is. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what, what's your why? Number one, why do you care? That's, you know, I, I'm just, you know, and I'm not saying that from a racial perspective, I'm no. just saying from a human perspective. Why well, I, I care because we're all humans. We're all part of the, uh, human we're all human beings we're not all the color of our skin we're the color of our humanity um we're all the same human beings we all bleed the same blood and after george floyd's murder you know let's just call it what it was and um and uh i was grieving i was reaching out to my friends of color to make sure they were okay and hearing the stories, I mean, I still get teary. Uh, and I think I have never had to go through that as a white woman. And one of my friends, we used to talk like, I never, I worry as a mother letting my three sons go out at night. Not, but I don't worry as a black mother letting my three sons go out at night. And her worries and my worries were much different. And, um, but talking to my friends through all of this, I was just grieving the stories I was hearing. And, um, you know, I had been down to, I'd been mostly the first protest I didn't really hear about until after it had happened. So I went down the next day to help clean up Seattle because Seattle was in bad shape. And what I loved and I saw there was every walk of life helping families pulling carts with water and donuts and the homeless people helping scrub the graffiti and board up buildings. There was every, every nationality you could think of down there. There was, it was uh, just as one of my favorite, um, oh gosh, now I just thought, uh, lost her name. Jane Elliott says it's a salad bowl, you know? That's my, you know, that's my dear friend. I just, love her her work yeah. and she is um, the nails yeah but you know we're a salad bowl so we had a salad bowl of people down there and um but i i realized i was just grieving and so i started looking for grief and black lives matter online you know finding out what was what was out there to support people that were grieving and i couldn't find anything and so i reached out to a friend that's a grief coach. And I said, would you want to do this with me? And then I had a couple of people say, you can do that as a white woman, aren't you? I mean, do you really think you can do that? We don't think you can as a white woman. I'm like, well, I'm going to try because I'm grieving. I, I know my friends are grieving. So let's put something together. So I, I started what was called Grief and Black Lives Matter. Then it went to Grief and BIPOC Matters because there's you know so much going on. And now with Asian hate, uh, what's gone on with the Native Americans, we have people in and out of our calls from all different different walks of life. But really the focus was grief and Black Lives Matter. And we keep it non-political because, you know, we all have our political agendas. And this is just a place to come and share. And as one woman said, it's a place where I can be vulnerable. And I don't have to worry if I'm cranky. I don't have to worry if I cry. I don't have to worry if I don't say anything. And um, so it's become a very sacred, safe place. And my friend and I said, we'll do it as long as people show up. And people keep showing up. They keep showing up because they are open to the conversation. Yeah. I had two strange things. <laughs> One of my friends said, April, I don't know what to say. I, I don't know what to do. You know, I'll use my white privilege. I told her, I said, baby, it's not a visa card. <laughs> you can't just whip it out and you know uh so they don't people don't know what to say they don't know they don't say anything it's the same as with death you they know they don't, don't know what to say so they don't say anything and i'm always like you don't need to know what to say say no. i don't know what to say exactly i had a woman that was in the target i'm in line you know i rock an afro and uh had my black lives t-shirt matter on and i mean you know she was in the back and she, I don't know why anybody should be singled out. I don't know why race, one race should be, you know, more uh, superior than others. I don't know why, but, you know, so she was baiting me, right? And I'm saying to myself, okay, April, you have a choice here. How are you going to show up? On the evening news? <laughs> or, or are you going to make this a teachable moment? I decided to make it a teachable moment. I politely stepped and I told her, 
I don't know what you're feeling. I said, but I can tell you in your feelings. I said, and yes, Black Lives Matter right now. I said, because this is who I am and this is who I have to represent. And if I don't represent myself, nobody else is going to represent us. I don't know if you've had a bad experience with black people. I don't know if someone's hurt you. I said, but if you'd like for me to give you my business card, we can go out and have coffee. We can talk about it. I said, but, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get ugly. And I know that you're talking to me. She went from the 12th floor down to the basement. Whew. Her face turned beet red. Everybody in line. I mean, it was a line in Target. Everybody was looking because, you know, they was ready to get those cell phone cameras out. They was waiting for me to just, you know, duke her up. And I'm not going to do it. When I walked outside the door, she was parked not too far from where I was parked. I winked my eye at her and looked at her. And she just held her head down and got in the car. It was a teachable moment. So now, whatever other interaction that she has with another black person, she's got a choice how she's going to show up. Right. Whatever experience she had before was not the experience that she had today with me. And I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be an angry black woman. No. Because I'm, you know what? I need to be strategic. I need yeah. to teach people that I cannot control the color of my skin, but I can control the content of my heart. We all get to live from the choice we want to make. That's I right. mean, and to control the content of our heart. You say that, and I just did a post on Juneteenth, and I said, until like three years ago, I didn't even know what Juneteenth was, mm -hmm. because we were never taught it. So I did this little post on Juneteenth, and someone I uh, know from college days, she came back with this post. Um, yeah, you think this is great, but what about the Native Americans and the Alaskan and Native women and all this? You live so close to the Canadian border, you think this would matter to you and blah, blah, blah. And, and I sat there for a moment and I thought, I could just ignore it, I can be angry, or I can respond. So I said, thank you for sharing your thoughts. And um, I said, I do care about what's happening in our Native American community. In fact, I had just been on a webinar about that. And, um, and I said, so I appreciate what you're saying. And yes, atrocious things have happened to Native Americans in our country. Uh, and, but I said, this is about the um, emancipation of the black slaves in Texas two years after Lincoln said the Emancipation Proclamation. I said, this has nothing to this day is for my friends of color that are celebrating their Independence Day. And I said, so while I appreciate that, that has nothing to do with today, but I so appreciate your, your comments and I would love to have a conversation with you sometime. And she came back to me and said, thank you so much for not just jumping all over me because so many people do. And, I, and so we ended up taking it offline. Um, but I said, you know, that's great, but you can't come in such an accusatory manner when it had nothing to do, the Native Americans right. and exactly. Alaska right. Natives have nothing to do with Juneteenth. Right. It was a totally separate subject, but we were able to talk it out, which was hard for me because I know we have different thoughts. Right. Absolutely. That's, 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 that's the beauty of it. Yes. It's that it's hard. It's hard. Nine is hard through that conversation, you know, maybe each of us grew a little bit and, um, and to, I always think there's a man and now I can't remember his name, compassionate curiosity. Mm. And so I try really hard to practice that uh, ever since I've heard him speak a couple of times. Um, I'm going to find his name, uh, Waze Christensen or something like that just a beautiful soul, but this compassionate curiosity and to come at thinking they're hurting in some way. And it's usually fear-based. That's why people don't talk about death. They're afraid. They're afraid. They don't talk they're about afraid. racial issues or they're afraid because they don't know. Exactly. And so like you just had this educational moment of compassion for this woman in Target. Um, it's, we get, as my mom used to say, you catch more flies with honey than vinegar or whatever. So you do. Yeah. And, and, and it's, you know, like you never get a second chance to make a first impression. Yes. And your That's last so impression powerful. is so powerful, you know? So I encourage all of us to, you know, think about what we're doing as we're living, 
or as we're dying. You know, how are you treating people? How are you showing up? How are you responding? Are you forgiving? Are you having those conversations? Are you being honest? Are you showing up authentic? Are you disingenuous? Are you mean? Are you cruel? These are a bunch of questions that you can sit there and have a conversation with yourself, Brains. You don't need me and Maureen, okay? We're not the be-all, end-all, but we're walking the walk, and we're talking the talk, and we're sharing it with you. You know, we have seen things. We have heard things. We have lived. She's lived the white experience. I've lived the black experience. She has seen life and death. I've seen life and death. You know, I get chills just thinking about it because it's real, and there's nothing that we can do about it. But what we can try to do is be the best possible human beings while we're on this planet. Because there is going to be some judgment one way or another. Right? That's right. That's right. I love and adore you. Tell my brains how to get in contact with you. I want them to, uh, if you're open enough, bold enough, and have enough courage, and, uh, you know, and you are considerate, please join Maureen's group. Um, I've listened in. Some good stuff. Uh you can just go and listen. You don't have to have a conversation. You don't have to have input, but you might learn something. And also contact her about finding out what you can do to prepare yourself for end of life. Even if you're a person that doesn't have family, you might want to leave all your belongings to the Humane Society. Put that in writing. If you don't have it in writing, they're not going where you want them to go. It's going right back to the state to you know do whatever it is they want to do with it. So tell them how to get in contact with you, sweetheart. Well, they can get in contact with me by going to my website. It's called Radiant Morning, spelled M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, like morning, like grief, uh, dot com, radiantmorning.com. And there's a little button that says, let's chat. I'd love to have a complimentary chat with you and just see where you're at, answer any questions that I can. Or they can. you can go and sign up for my newsletter at startthetalknow.com and you'll get a free prompt, seven prompts to get the conversation started. And around my grief call that we do the second, the first Tuesday of every, no, the second Tuesday, now I'm getting confused. The second Tuesday of every month at 4 p.m. Pacific time. Um, if you reach out to me through my Facebook messenger, Maureen Curis, uh, Facebook, or just send me Maureen at MaureenCurist.com that you're interested. And my last name is spelled K-U-R-E-S. So MaureenCurist.com. I will send you the Zoom link. I don't post it anywhere because I have been on a couple Zoom meetings where they've been hacked and I just won't do that. So no, I'd love to have you join any conversation, but reach out and, and I'd love to, I'd love to chat. Well, I'd love for them to chat with you, and I love chatting with you here on the edge. You know, you are just really a special human being in so many different ways. I love nurses. Nurses and teachers uh, are my favorite people on the planet because you're so much of a giver. I mean, you didn't have to sacrifice your life to blood and gut and, and pain and sorrow. <laughs> But then, too, there's glory on the other side when you see that patient walk out and they've been in ICU for, you know, God knows how long. Or, you know, you've been able to help a family make that transition and write down what they want their final wishes to be. Or you've been able to educate someone that was ignorant to the plight of another human being. I don't care if they're black, white, Asian, green, Mexican, Native American you know you're really sacrificing yourself. And sometimes you, we put a, a bullseye on our back. I know I do. But uh, it is what it is. And somebody has to be strong. And I'm glad it's you and me. Oh, thank you. Okay. My honor. Big love and hug and kisses. Brains, handle your business. Okay? And stay out of other folks' business. Because <laughs> that's what we do. We get in your business on the edge. I love you. I'll talk to you soon, Maureen. Thanks, April. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye. Bye.